Right. A couple more questions here in the audience. This gentleman is waiting right here. Hi, uh, Ben Schwegler from Walt Disney. We've heard a lot about some very interesting infrastructure so far tonight, uh, but nothing so far about the infrastructure uh, of the people who actually build the roads. So this may be for GM and maybe for the senator. What plans do you have to use this uh, introduction of the Volt as a way of participating in the larger policy debate about transportation policy, about roads, about, for example, congestion pricing, things like that? Do you expect that this will be a catalyst to engage in a broader dialogue about those transportation issues? Good question. Uh, it, it, it has started uh, that, that discussion. Um, we had a bill that uh, would allow this uh, next generation of electric vehicles to, in fact, uh, uh, replace the Prius and to allow them to access the HOV lanes. I think there's been a lot of discussion now uh, at, uh, at the Senate uh, about whether or not that's going to degrade further the HOV lanes. And so that's created a larger discussion about, well, how do we bring to market some of the next generation vehicles? What incentives do we, in fact, uh, provide uh, over and above just HOV lane? So it, it has created a, a lot of discussion about uh, what is it that we're going to do uh, dealing with uh, our infrastructure, the overcrowding on many of our uh, highways and freeways, and figuring out the, then how do you incentivize individuals in different ways to um, uh, at least move traffic as quickly as we can and get it uh, done as uh, environmentally safe as possible. Right here in the front. Uh, Chelsea Sexton. I I'm wondering if this is not maybe perhaps too pragmatic a conversation at this point. Um, there's a bunch of EV1 drivers in the room. There's few driveway Equinox drivers in the room. And we know how much they resonate, not just to all of these pragmatic things, but the emotional component that comes with buying and driving and owning a vehicle. And in the three E's, I have to wonder if you're not leaving out the most important one when it comes to cultivating ambassadors, and that's the experience. We know, having analyzed the last generation of drivers, that the cause-driven folks are the smallest group, and the largest are the ones who want it because it's cool, it's fast, it's fun, it's the new thing to have, and nothing that has to do with a penny or two per kilowatt hour at night. So how much, how much, do you, or how comfortable are you with the community that you're going into, and how much do you think that emotional experience and that community basis will play into your early adopters and your early market. Absolutely, um, you know, so we're, we're, we blog with you all the time, so we're uh, I think we're they're, they're twittering up front here, uh, and so the I mean that's the beauty of today. We when we first started, uh, you know, building our Corvettes for the last uh, number of years, uh, we had a blog before there was blog. Uh, they told us exactly what they wanted on the cars. That's the same experience here. So the emotional aspect. Um, is is the fourth E. Um, so you've actually stolen part of my speech, but yeah. And uh, so you can start with emotion first, or you can end with uh, economics last, depending. I start with the emotion first myself, but uh, absolutely. And uh, and I think that's what we're learning, and that's where we have to develop the right balance. And uh, I think you'll see that all new technology adopters will set the trend for everyone else, whether it's in automobiles or other technologies. And the emotional aspect of being first or being part of that story is part of what we want to make sure that we capture. So we get to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. Uh, we have to move beyond just learning individuals to learning societies, learning organizations. And uh, that's a key part of that. So trying to figure the connectivity, which is the advantage of today's uh, technology to stay more connected with the communication, will allow us to do uh, much better in this. So it is part of the marketing plan to come. Great. Uh, we're going to go now from the emotional to the technical. We have a very uh, technical question. Wouldn't many electrical infrastructure problems be solved by large utility scale electrical storage capacity, which could do load leveling for the entire grid? Sodium sulfur, vanadium, and other chemistries difficult to employ on a small scale wouldn't compete with EVs for unit production or feedstocks. That is a question from Jackson at gm-volt.com. Mark, do you care to address? Emotionally. Um, it, is, it is important to understand that there isn't some magical market just waiting out there for vehicles to put power back into the grid. So this is why I think that you have to make vehicles that could stand on their own even if all they ever did was charge from the grid. And I think that's important. So obviously having a dedicated group of early adopters that are willing to sell one to all hundred, you know, a hundred of their friends and to do all these things and to be champions for the technology, that's very important. 
on the grid side, there's all sorts of technologies competing for the load leveling duties and the regulation services and the other things. There's stationary energy storage. Uh, just recently, um, Southern California Edison was awarded a huge project to do one of the largest lithium ion stationary batteries. It'll be one of the largest in the world to do, uh, to do uh, grid regulation and support for wind. Uh, Pacific Gas and Electric, um, uh, a, a huge award for uh, underground compressed air energy storage to, that can load level a massive wind farm and store it as compressed air underground and put it back on the grid very efficiently. So there's lots of incredible technologies out there and they're all, they all have an advantage over the vehicles in that they're located in one spot, professionally run, and that's their mission in life is to do just that. So we, I think we have to really look at the vehicles very cleverly and say, how can you get in there and find some service, whether it's the ability to demand response. Well, our, my vehicle will turn off at the end of the day. And I, I get a very small incentive to do that, but you multiply that by 100,000 times and you get a very large benefit. So I think we have to be very clever and think about what the vehicles are good at and not push them maybe to do things that might be a much more difficult or, in, or you know, impinge on their primary duty, which is to drive and drive on electricity. Good. Okay, we have time for just two more questions, so uh, I'm going to go to this gentleman on the end right here and try to keep him short, please. David Tarlow, Kettering University. Um, I know GM is very focused on this technology, both in the Volt and, if you believe, the Detroit Free Press that Converge as well. What is the future development of not only this technology, but you have tons of other automakers out there developing electric-only vehicles? What is GM's future? opinion of and work on EV only vehicles? Yeah, we're, um, we, we, we believe in the EV category, so just think of it as, you know, we think of electric as a category of propulsion. So whether it's electric with a range extender, which we think has a great appeal in many markets, uh, particularly mature markets like this. Uh, we are working in India with electric only vehicle uh, with, uh, with our development in India as well. So I, I, think, I think the most important thing is, you know, finding the right match to each of the consumers in each of the markets. And, and, and that's, that's really the challenge and the opportunity. So is there a play for straight electric? Uh, yes. And will it be developed in some markets? Absolutely. Uh, will we be able to go further ranges over time? Absolutely. So uh, we, we think that this is a, a, a right alternative for today in on a North American, European context. A great interest in Asia and other markets, as we said, but uh, whether it's pure electric or straight electric without a range extender, um, the electric category itself has to continue to develop. And whether it's all the manufacturers participating, I think you're going to see that. And through that learning technology, we'll be able to offer next generations and next generations as a propulsion alternative. Um, so, yes, stay tuned, and uh, we see that as, uh, as an alternative for depending on the, the needs of the market. Great.